Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today was a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War and served time in a military prison for refusing his order to fight. In his 20s, he roamed across the United States, went to Europe twice, and made one journey around the world. In 1983, he landed in Japan, where he became a professor at a private university and retired as a professor emeritus. He's the author of three novels, a novella, and over 20 research papers on teaching. His latest book is a memoir and tribute to his mother. It's titled, The Good Lord Willing and the Creek Don't Rise, Penamino Memories of Mom and Me. He and his wife still reside in Japan. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Robert W. Norris. Well, thank you, Julia. Uh, I'm glad to be here and uh, look forward to our chat. Robert, our opening question on Authors Over 50 is always, what took you so long to write that first book? Well, yeah, uh, when my mother died about oh, three years ago, uh, she was approaching the age of 95, so she'd had a, a you know long and fulfilling life, but I wanted to somehow preserve her spirit and, and pay tribute to her, so uh, I had decades worth of Oh, emails and regular mails, you know, with the stamps on them back before the internet and uh, oh, some audio uh, versions of uh, stories, family stories that she recorded, even a couple of videos. So I, I had a lot of stuff to go through and I had been writing a lot, uh, oh, kind of autobiographical fiction, you know, throughout my life. I'd had quite a nomadic and adventurous <laughs> life up to now. Anyway, uh, I thought, well, maybe the best way to do that is kind of combine our two stories together and, and show the, the really strong influence that she had on me and, uh, you know, what our relationship was like and uh, our searches for identity. And so in the end, well, uh, I, I managed to go through two or three uh versions and I was happy with one and it turned out to be a kind of combination uh, biography memoir that covered uh, oh, maybe a hundred years or so including a lot of her old family stories from back in the the 20s and the 30s and uh, I was pretty happy with the way it turned out so I started uh, sending it out to see if any indie publishers would be interested in, in publishing it and that uh, it took about a year to write and and then uh another year before I got any publishers interested in it. But in the end, I ended up uh, getting involved with uh, uh, what they call a hybrid publisher. Uh, he was uh, part of a, a group of three uh, people who had started an indie publisher, kind of a, a niche type uh, publisher that focused on books about uh, oh, different countries in Asia uh, written in English. And he had uh, been kind of successful with that, but they'd had a lot of difficulty selling memoirs. They travel. They focus mainly on uh, travel stories and uh, oh, a few how-to type books, you know, nonfiction mainly. And uh, he decided that uh, he wanted to give a try with his own independent hybrid press. And uh, when I queried him. 
he wrote back and said, well, I'm really interested in your story, but uh, we've had a real tough time trying to sell memoirs, so I can offer you this option. And by that time, I'd probably queried about 75 or 80 different publishers, and a couple were kind of interested, but I, I never heard back from them again. So I was considering you know, doing the self-publishing route myself and starting to research about it, but I thought, hmm, I'm not so tech savvy. Maybe it'd be better to have a, a real professional go through the the editing and the formatting and the cover design and everything. And, and so uh, we negotiated over the price and because I was the first one and he thought that it didn't really need that much uh, editing that uh, he gave me a rock bottom price. And so I said, okay, let, let's go for it. And that's how it started. And it finally got published oh, about a year ago. And, and the unfortunate thing is that he got sick, really sick about the same time that it was coming out. And so he decided to hand over uh, all the files to me and he uh, set up uh, some accounts with Ingram Sparks and uh, the KDP Amazon site. And, uh, you know, all the did a really nice cover design and, I was really happy with the formatting and the layout. And so it turned out to be kind of a self-publishing <laughs> work. And uh, so I ended up getting like 100% of, of the royalties uh, because uh, unfortunately for him, he just couldn't deal with that anymore. And so since that time, uh, I've managed to put it out there for the world. And, you know, you know good luck with, him with that. <laughs> if it reaches enough readers. Well, whether you're with one of the big five publishing houses or with a, a small publishing house, you know, I think we all fall in the same boat these days. We have to do a lot of our own legwork for everything that <laughs> pertains to our books. Yeah, that's for sure. And uh, if you don't have much experience in that world, it, it's, a lengthy process of learning step by step and trying to research as much as possible of, of how to get the word out there and a lot of uh, hit and miss. <laughs> you know, you, but you learn from your mistakes and you learn to do better the next time. And uh, yeah. Yeah, somehow I, I've managed to you know, have a few uh, blog uh, reviews, uh, got a couple of good reviews from independent uh, sources on board and I've been trying out these podcasts and fortunately places like yours have uh, had me on as a guest. And again, uh, the more you do this kind of thing, the, the better you get, uh, you get better at uh, uh, how to write a good query letter and how to, you have to do a lot of research on the places that uh, you're, you're targeting. And uh, yeah, it, it's an interesting learning experience. Uh, I, I retired seven years ago. So this is, a hobby that's turned into a full-time, uh, almost a job. Not so much the writing anymore, but the, the the promotional part. Exactly. And I think, you know, it's such a love story to your mother. It's a great legacy to leave for your family. And that's what I always say about my books. I just want to show my children and grandchildren that you know, no matter what age you are, no matter what you've accomplished in life, you can still have new goals and new dreams. Yeah, and uh, I'm 73 years old now, so uh, it, it helps keep me young as well, <laughs> you know, keep the brain active. And uh, I've had good responses from uh, family members. Of course, as a memoir, there's always that danger of stepping on somebody's toes and and maybe your view of uh, what your childhood or your, your adolescence was like uh, uh, differs greatly from what their views were. But uh, in the end, uh, yeah, everybody's been pretty happy with the way things turned out. And so I feel really fortunate in that, that regard. Yeah. Some of those bring out a lot of family secrets that families don't want brought out, but yeah. you know, everybody has a different perspective and different memory. Even my three children who grew up in the same house, I'll ask them a question about a story or a memory that I have. And they'll say, we don't remember that that way at all. You know, yeah. <laughs> or, or that's not how it happened. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's so interesting to me. 
I'm also very interested in how expats choose where to live. What was it about Japan that drew you there and held you there for 41 years? Yeah, well, that's kind of a long story, but, uh, and, well, I can always say, well, read the book. <laughs> but actually, uh, yeah, I grew up, uh, well, we all did during a very, you know, tumultuous time, the 1960s. And, uh, you know, uh, as a young man at that time, we were facing the draft and the Vietnam War. And uh, I ended up joining the Air Force as what I thought would be uh an alternative to the draft and and the possibility of uh, being sent to the front lines was uh, reduced quite a bit and actually the the recruiter the air force recruiter that i talked to uh sold me this story that uh, life would be just grand and i would have all these adventures and i could play basketball 24 hours a day and you know everything would just be peaches and cream and i bought it hook line and sinker and about two minutes after I went to boot camp, I realized I'd made a big mistake. <laughs> and I ended up being put in a, a career field uh, that was combat trained and had to learn how to use uh, all these different weapons. And uh, my job was uh, guarding B-52 bombers. And uh, eventually I would be sent overseas to the war. And, and at the time, there even from within the military, there was a lot of... Uh, anti-war activity going on and underground papers being distributed and uh, discussion groups. And I became involved with a, a couple of fellows who were putting out an underground newspaper that was uh, very strictly anti-war. And they were covering the, the My Lai massacre and uh, interviewing a lot of uh, returning GIs who had uh, become anti-war themselves. And so, and the music of the times played a great influence and, uh, eventually, I, I started thinking a lot about uh, the war and, 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 you know, didn't feel that I could support it at all. And uh, there was the option of uh, applying for conscientious objector status, which I did. And, of course, that was refused. And then when my order finally came, uh, I decided rather than try to run away to Canada or go underground or uh any of the other options that were seemingly available uh i decided to fight uh, the military itself and of course that's a losing proposition so i i was court martialed and facing uh po potentially 5 years in prison and uh in the end i was found not guilty of the original charge against me which in military terms was uh willful disobedience to a direct lawful order. But I was found guilty of a lesser military crime of what they called negligent disobedience to a direct lawful order. And the, the difference between those two was that I never used the word no when I was given my order. I just kept repeating the same sentence. Uh, I don't feel I'm mentally or physically capable of killing another human being. And so I, I was uh, given six months in prison and i served my six months and then returned to society as a kind of uh, confused young man i was 19 years old at the time and uh over the next couple of years i i tried uh, going to school and playing basketball but uh, my experiences had been such that uh, i just felt kind of alienated from others in my age group who hadn't really had the same experiences so in, in a kind of uh, search for identity, I ended up hitching across the States and bumming around Europe for about six months or so. And I, I came into contact with a lot of uh, young European hippies of the time who were writing music and or playing music and writing poetry and, and uh, very active and seemed uh, like they had very exciting, fulfilled lives. And they encouraged me to... Uh, express myself uh, in some manner as well and so uh, under their influence when my money ran out and i came back to the states again i decided oh, i want to try writing yeah so under the influence of uh, those european uh, hippies i returned to the states and uh, began studying uh, literature and, and writing on my own and and i was working a lot of labor jobs at the time and that continued for about four more years and so I had saved some money from actually working on the oil rigs uh, out of Texas at the time. 
And uh, I was ready to uh, write a novel, so I returned to Paris. And while I was in Paris playing out my Ernest Hemingway fantasy, I uh, ended up meeting a, a young man from Afghanistan and another from Iran who were trying to convey a message to the desk clerk at this cheap hotel that I was staying in. And I'd picked up enough French by that time that I could uh, provide a a very crude uh, translation for them. And they were overjoyed at, at that. And so we went out for a, a cup of tea to celebrate and they invited me back to their countries. And that was the start of about a 10 month long journey that ended up taking me through Iran and Afghanistan and, and into India. And when I returned to the States uh, with a severe case of uh, reverse culture shock, <laughs> uh, I had had enough experiences uh, that you know overseas and adventures that uh, that I I my new dream became that I wanted to live and work and study in a, a foreign country because during all these journeys I I only spoke English and I was so envious of all these young people who could speak three or four different languages and so uh Oh, I, I just started uh, working again, uh, mainly as a cook in those days, but I'd saved up enough money, maybe five or six thousand dollars to try to write another novel. And I had a writer friend who was living in Hawaii in on the island of Maui, and he invited me to come stay with him and I could write there. So I did. And this fellow had actually been more popular in Japan than he had been in the States. His books had been translated in, into Japanese and he had visited Japan a couple of times. And he told me about the possibility of working as an English teacher. You know, Japan's economy was really starting to boom then. This was 1982, 83. And there was a great demand for English teachers to mainly teach like a lot of their engineers to go overseas to work in factories. and. So uh, he gave me the address of a friend and I wrote to the friend who said he'd put me up as, until I could you know, get started. And I found a job in a conversation school within uh, the first week or so. And that was the beginning and uh, never looked back. And you know, now 41 years later, I'm retired. I ended up working at a Japanese university. Uh, I, I should add that at that time I had no real qualifications. But I, I found a correspondence course, uh, an American uh, university that provided one uh, in the teaching of English as uh, a second or foreign language uh, in an uh, educational man uh, major. It took about seven years and I was working full time in different companies and, and conversation schools. But when I finally uh, got my master's degree, uh, I happened to have a, a part-time job teaching at a women's junior college. And at the same time, an opening came up for a full-time foreign instructor. And I applied and they hired me, mainly because by that time I could speak enough Japanese that I could participate in meetings and go out on such things as uh, high school visits to try to recruit students. And so uh, just very, very lucky the whole time. And uh of course, my mother was always there, always supportive, and uh, she had had quite an adventurous uh, life herself. And uh, we stayed in contact, and so we always had, uh, e well, no email back then, but uh, we probably wrote two or three letters uh, a week to each other, and every once in a while a phone call. And so, yeah, when I look back now, it, it seems like a big dream. <laughs> Did your yeah. mother ever get to come to visit in Japan? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Yeah, she she was a very strong, independent woman, and uh, she ended up uh, divorcing twice. And uh, at, in her forties, she managed to go to night school and uh, gain a qualification to become a legal secretary. And so she became a legal secretary. Uh, in her fifties, uh, she. Uh, got a license, or no, I got that wrong. In her 40s, she, she got a private pilot's license, and she actually worked for two summers for the forestry service as a fire spotter in the Lake Tahoe area. <laughs> and then in her 50s, she went to night school and got uh, qualified as a legal secretary, and she ended up working until she was 78 years old. So 
very, very independent, uh, stubborn, you know, strong-willed, and she had an adventurous spirit herself. She visited Japan about eight different times and, uh, you know, started studying Japanese in her 60s. And uh, we actually took a trip one time uh, to kind of search for her roots. Her father's uh, ancestors were from Ireland. And so uh, we took a trip one summer with uh, my wife and uh, the three of us, you know, just toured around Ireland. And we ended up finding the old homestead the original home that her, her, whatever it was, you know, nine generations back, great, 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 great grandfather came from. And uh, it was just a magical time. And so, yeah, wonderful memories. <laughs> well, we can see where you got that adventurous spirit from then, if your mother was such a, a adventurer herself. Yeah, yeah, she was. And, uh, she actually visited Costa Rica, Canada, maybe a couple other countries on her own as well. And uh, she was always, yeah, she was very artistic. She she wrote poetry and, and painted and uh, played music. Music was a big part of her life too. And uh, yeah, she she actually was my best friend. At some point, she stopped being my mother and became my best friend. <laughs> it's lovely when that happens. If that happens you know yeah yeah well talking about your mother has made me want to hear more about the passages that you've brought to share today so why don't you read so we can hear your tone and voice in the book okay yeah i've got the book right here and the passage that i chose or maybe i should show the you know the cover for your viewers there and you know my proud of my mom (laughs) yes she's beautiful and that your title is something that my southern father used a lot we'd ask him if he was going to come for supper and he'd say if the lord's willing and the creek don't rise (laughs) yeah that the reason i chose that as the title for the book was uh, my mother was a very uh, optimistic, uh, positive person, but a little bit superstitious at the same time. And so every time she would uh, try to encourage us kids, if we were you know, having some kind of problem that we were dealing with, or if she had some hope uh, or dream that she was pursuing, she would always express that. And then as an afterthought, she would always add, uh, the good Lord willing and the creek don't rise. And then, uh, I thought, well, that expression really describes her personality quite well. Then the pentimental memories part, uh, I got that from uh, uh, the writer Lillian Hellman, uh, who was a playwright and and a memoirist who uh, actually was Dashiell Hammett's uh, lover for about 30 years. They never got married, but uh, they were part of... uh, well, the early 50s, the House on American Activities Committee, you know, was uh, investigating uh, all these uh, Hollywood people, uh, you know, for uh, trying to during the uh, what the witch hunting days of the communist hunts. And anyway, she uh, appeared before the House on American Activities Committee, and and she really was quite well known in the uh, in the period that. Uh, well, she was the most active. And so looking back when she was in her 60s, she wrote uh, a memoir called Pentimento. And she took that, uh, or she used it as a kind of metaphor for, for memory. And it, it, the term comes from uh, the painting world. Uh, uh, when, when a painter draws or makes a sketch or, or, or starts a painting and then changes midway, and repent, so to speak. So an original uh, scene might be like a, a scene of a, a, a forest in, in the distance or something, but then they change it and it becomes a, a scene of uh, the ocean or something like that. So they uh, change their mind and they see things differently and, and using it as a metaphor for memory, you know, the older we get and the more we look back on our, our past experiences they change as we get older and so i thought hmm that my memories were the same way after mom died and i was going through all the 
the letters and everything, my my memories of her and my, my own life changed from what they'd been in my 20s and 30s. So I thought that was appropriate. Anyway, uh, this uh, passage is from the preface and uh, it starts out explaining why I wrote uh, this story. And I had to write the obituary for my mother. And that was really difficult to do. How do you summarize someone's life in, you know, four or five paragraphs? And so afterwards, my uh, sister and a close cousin, uh, they seemed to be very happy with it, but I, I felt a bit empty. And so this is uh, to explain why I wrote uh, the story and my feelings at the time. So everyone was pleased with it. A local newspaper ran the obit with a wonderful picture from mom's high school days. I felt empty. Could mom's life, her vitality, her entire essence be reduced to four paragraphs of dry, dreary prose? Was that how people would remember her? She was so much more than that. In many ways, mom's is the story of a remarkable American woman, a fighter, and a survivor of the time in which she lived. As a child, her experience of traveling across the United States with her family in the early days of the Great Depression was not unlike that of the Jode family in Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. Being ostracized by a small logging community in the late 1950s for her divorce and later being kicked out of the Catholic Church when she remarried were symbolic experiences. When I became a conscientious objector, refused my order to fight in the Vietnam War, got court-martialed and spent time in a military prison. Mom bravely defended me against patriotic and conservative friends, colleagues, neighbors, and family members who considered me a coward and a traitor. This courage also exemplified her life. At heart, she was a feminist ahead of her time who fought against sexual and power harassment in the home and workplace. After her second divorce, in addition to her main day job as a legal secretary, she took on two hourly wage jobs, one wrapping presents at a mall and one splitting time between night clerking and cleaning rooms at a hotel in order to pay off thousands of dollars in gambling debts her second husband left behind. She didn't have money for gas, so she bicycled to work in the snow. In her 40s, when she was a licensed pilot flying for the Department of Forestry as a forest fire spotter, she became chairperson of the Reno chapter of 99s, the women pilots organization whose first president was Amelia Earhart. Later, she took night classes to qualify as a legal secretary, worked at three law firms in that capacity, and finally retired at 78. In the end, she'd gained a hard earned independence and a pension to pay for living expenses for herself and my sister, who could not work because of disability caused by multiple sclerosis. Mom was an artistic soul who painted oil and sumie scenes of animals and nature, wrote haiku poems, and played the piano for social gatherings. She played the Catholic church organ for seven years of Sunday sermons before her priest refused to administer communion one Sunday after her divorce. When he bypassed her at the communion rail, she grabbed him and gave him a piece of her mind in front of the whole congregation. She was an adventurer who traveled to Japan, Ireland, Costa Rica, and Canada. She made friends with people in all those countries and kept up a lifelong correspondence with many of them. She was an athlete who, in addition to her high school cheerleading and majorette activities, played golf, umpired little league games, bowled in a city league, water skied, roller skated, practiced aerobics, and did a lot of mountain trekking. In short, she was a ball of energy. Her hug was the strongest and best in the world. Her love was true, and you knew she meant it when she hugged you. Oh, Robert, that is lovely. What a remarkable woman you had for a mother. Yeah, I feel really blessed and lots of good memories. And yeah. Uh, any, anybody who reads this book, I think can't help, but fall in love with my mother as well. And, and on the side, learned a few about my own adventures in life. <laughs> it's very wonderful. Yeah. What does writing success look like to you? 
Well, certainly not in any monetary form, <laughs> but uh, it's been such a part of my life for so long that uh, uh, just whenever I, I get any uh, these days, you know, email or uh, from somebody who's uh, read either this book or one of my other books, uh, and actually, you know, got something out of it. That's such a gratifying uh, experience, and and that's what I think we as as writers hope for and live for is is just the understanding of a reader or or somebody who can feel some kind of. Uh, empathy for the characters you've created or the experiences that you've written about. And so even if just a few hundred people read the book, it doesn't have to become, you know, a bestseller on, on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, I, I think most poets feel that way. Most musicians feel that way. And, and that it, it's, it's the old uh, 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 cliche of uh, it's, it's not the destination, it's the journey. And I think, it, you know, at this stage of, of life, it gives you a, a reason to get up in the morning and, and uh, look forward to the day and have something to do, knowing that you're expressing some truth that you have that maybe others will, you know, empathize with. And to me, that's, that's the success. It gives a purpose to life. <laughs> I certainly agree with that. You know, when I wrote my first book, it was it had threads of memoir running running through it because I'm an adopted child from a maternity home in uh, New Orleans. And that's what the book was about is three young women meeting there to relinquish their babies for adoption. And I just was so honored to hear from people who reached out to me. You know, I, I heard from the entire adoption community, the birth mothers and the other adoptees and the adoptive families. And, you know, when when they honor you with their own stories and how your book touched them, then, you know, that that's real success. Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah. And then uh, there's also the, the part of, of uh, trying to understand your own life. You know, <laughs> life is pretty confusing at times. And and as you get older, of course, you can look back and, and see the connections between different uh, experiences and uh, people that you met, uh, almost as if there was some uh, something con concerning predestiny, perhaps. You know, you can interpret it a lot of different ways. But, uh, yeah, it allows you to look back, to explore, to, yeah, in a sense, that pentimental feeling of reliving the past, but through a slightly different uh, lens. And, and uh, I, that's quite interesting to me, too. You can read a poem a hundred different times and each time have a different reaction to it, depending on your state of mind during the day. And yeah, it's just something that's it's part of our soul, I guess. Uh, we were somehow you know blessed to be able to uh, find that outlet and then it's been a sustaining force throughout life and it's out in the world and it always will be so it really truly is a legacy that will far outlive us and it will still be on library shelves and in bookstores and among our friends and family and strangers who found it so i think we're very blessed to have that legacy to leave yeah yeah you're absolutely right. <laughs> and, you know, in a sense, uh, well, in my own life, you know, I, I've spent more than half of my life uh, in a foreign country. And so uh, it allows me to go back and kind of uh, see America uh, again. You know, it's uh, this new reality is, is actually more real to me now than my previous life, uh, uh, you know, bombing around uh, different parts of America as well and experiencing the, the educational system and, and uh, friendships and family in those days. But uh, dealing with life in Japan is also a, a different kind of reality. And, and it's an exciting one. It has been for 41 years, but it's also had its ups and downs. And so, uh, yeah, even personally, when you go back and, and review your own life, which, uh, I think most of us do from time to time, and maybe more so during the pandemic years than any other time. But uh, uh, again, it, it allows you to to 
review your life and uh, the decisions that you made, the, the, the friends that you made, the, the actions that you did, you know, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. But uh, yeah, it, it's all all positive in the end. Writing can certainly be therapy. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> Well, this has been a great visit with you today, all the way across the ocean to Japan. And as always, our last interview question on Authors Over 50 is, our writers over 50 are quite unique. Do you have advice for writers 50 and above? I think that it's a bit egotistical to take the viewpoint that I know more than other people <laughs> do. But I think the best advice that I could possibly give is that if if the urge hits you, uh, follow it, and don't don't be judgmental about your own work. You know, just uh, keep writing, keep writing. Uh, if you have it in you to write a book, uh, perseverance, uh, stubbornness all come into play. But uh, there's a it's a, a journey of discovery as well, and well worth taking. And so. Uh, I think maybe the best writing advice I ever found, well, in the early days when I was trying to, you know, follow this path, uh, came from Ernest Hemingway. And his approach to writing was that uh, he would stop in the middle of a scene. And in that way, he wouldn't uh, drain the well dry. And so that when he sat down to write the next day, he would have a starting place. And he wouldn't have to face a, a blank page. And so don't be afraid uh, of, you know, diving deep into the self to find out what, what exists there. And, and then always have a place to start the next day because it is a, a lengthy process. And, and then, of course, the rewriting and the editing is where the real writing takes place. So if you make it through that first draft, put it away for a while and then take it up again, because it will definitely have to be rewritten. <laughs> yeah, and, and just, yeah, perseverance, stamina. And if you've lived as long as we have, I think you've gained a certain amount of perseverance and stamina to take on a project like that. It's worth doing. And hindsight, we have lots of hindsight. We can now be the, the armchair quarterback and, and tell <laughs> others what life is all about when you reach this age. So yeah. we just appreciate your being with us here today. You've, you've had a, a wonderful, exciting life and, and a fabulous mother. So I think you're very blessed in so many ways. And we're excited to now count you among our authors over 50. Well, thank you very much, Julia. I've enjoyed this a lot. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like daily newspaper, dot com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third. <laughs>